Thanks for having me. And um, Easy Street, yo, it's been a while. So, you know, you actually were the first person to like bring me through the radio station years ago. I did like a contest you had and I had won or some something like that. And so, yo, shout out to you, man, because everything goes full circle. And I was just young as hell and like trying to put my music out there. So I got to tell you that why I got you right here. Appreciate cool. you, bro. Awesome, man. Well, okay, so you're talking about the, uh, the events that I used to have where I used to invite young artists from the DMV that were creating music to the radio station. We sit down, talk industry stuff, and then one by one, I would take everybody yep. in the studio yep. for an interview with you and play your track on my WOL show, right? Absolutely. Um, and I met a bunch of dope artists. I met Risa Renee that day. I met a couple people that um, I still, you know, keep in touch with just um, in the scene. So that's that's just some of this type of like dope things that, you know, you have to do when you're trying to like get your music out here. But, um, you know, being on the line with you right now and talking about what we're about to talk about, it's just like cool to see how full circle, you know, things go. Cause now I'm able to chop it up with you like this and we can educate, you know, other kids, other young artists, you know, about something new, so. Yeah. Awesome, well, hey man, congratulations, man, on the success. I'm glad I could be part of your story. And uh, Illumide is another one that's also here. He was there uh, at a couple. I, I did several of these events, you guys. I did probably mm -hmm. like like six of them. I did like six events uh, throughout the span of a couple of years where I was. And then what, we, what we're doing now with the Academy is just an extension of that work that I started to make sure that, that we're continuing to pass the torch, the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding about the, the music industry to, glow, to grow our artists because that's one thing about the history of DC music. Yeah. So insane, man. I mean, it's wild. The same, insane from Marvin Gaye to Ella Fitzgerald to all these greats, man, all the way up to, you know, Genuine to Johnny Gill to too many Wale to, to both. So, yeah. so it, it, it's, it's it just being able to see it all and be a part of it, you know, is it, a blessing. So now yeah. uh, tell us about your come up, man. Uh, where you let everybody know where you're from and how you got your start in music. All right, so for those that don't know me, um, obviously I'm Bo Young Prince. I'm from Southeast DC, born and raised. Um, I literally only left the city um, when I went away to college in North Carolina for a few years, and then I came back. And that's when I really kind of did my thing musically in the area. Um, but I always did performing arts. I used to act, I used to write music, all of that back in like high school and all of that. But it really cultivated when I came back to the city. So, um, you know, basically I got my start just throwing my own shows around DC. Um, I never turned down pretty much any live opportunity. And like um, Easy Street was just saying, I was just always looking for the next opportunity. And that kind of led to eventually in 2018, I signed a deal with Def Jam Records. And so ever since then, you know, we've just been rocking with them. And I've been putting out music and growing the campaign and whatnot. So um, it's been a very long journey. Like I started rapping in 08. So like, you know, I definitely came out when like I was looking at Wale and Tabby and people like that. So to see how far we have even come as a scene and to see how many people who have went on to sign deals and just how to, um, we're bringing industry back to DC. I think that's something really cool that I've watched develop over the years. And um, uniquely I've been a part of like kind of each turn, like low key. So like, if you know, you know, type of scenario. Um, so yeah, we, we signed a deal with Def Jam in 2018. I did a bunch of touring and um, that opened up opportunities for me to get my music and things like um, Into the Spider-Verse. I got my music in Yes Day, The Hate You Give, All American, Basketball Wives, like a bunch of TV shows and movies as well as games like Madden 20, Madden 21, Sims 4. And um, I kind of been finding this niche and like putting my, my music into like movies and video games and TV. And that's kind of like the theme of today, which we're talking about sync placement. So that's kind of how I've driven my career and like, made very interesting moves to get like larger audiences to pay attention. Um, so in a nutshell, that's like what I do, you know, um, with Def Jam, I tour, we drop music, we put our music in everything we can. And, um, you know, we just dropped home, um, we got the moves, it was featured in Coming to America and also yesterday in the same week. So, you know, that's what I'm about. That's, I like to put my music huge, in different man. things, yeah. I mean, that's huge in itself. Uh, for you to be, you know, part of the project to an iconic film that generations will be talking about for a very long time. I mean, coming to America, we're talking Eddie Murphy, yeah. you know, Arsenio Hall and what we just saw happen. 
Uh, the numbers on that film was were ridiculous. We know that um, our sister uh, Yana Crawley also yep. was in that film. Her music, her singing, and it was pretty dope. So just to see some 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 real live Washingtonians a part of that project um, is really dope. So let's let's break down a couple of things that that you've already mentioned and dig a little deeper um, mm -hmm. into your story. So the way this works for the new people in the building. Um, I'm going to ask the initial questions and then you're going to be able to jump in. So if you got questions okay. uh, as we um, begin this discussion, you can just throw your hand up and then we'll be coming to you one by one so you can uh, speak directly to uh, uh, to Bo yourself. Um, so my first question is this, bro. I want to know this. Why did you not give up? That's a good question. You could have. I mean, that's, that's a good question. Um, I think what drives me is, you know, I'm an artist at the core. Um, so whereas I did sports and I did this and that, I always was drawn to music. So I would be doing it, deal or no deal, indie, major, regardless. So that's one thing. You know, I just it's like that thing. You know, I just love the game, and I really do. Like I, I love moving the chess pieces. You know, I'm a political science major. So all of this is political to me, how I see it. So, I mean, I just feel like you don't really give up in anything that you're doing. I felt like there are times where it wasn't working as well or times where definitely coming out of DC in the DMV area, you feel like, man, people just not reacting how you need them to, how they reacting to me in other cities and places like that. But I kind of just saw the bigger picture because I was always bigger outside of DC than I was inside the city because of the music I make because of the lane I've created, you know, I operate within like the friction of the city. Like, you know, I'm in the South side, but I'm also uptown. It's like a, I have a crazy little campaign that I'm working. So also knowing that I'm doing things that are well within reach outside of the city, I never kind of focused on what was going on at home and the things that I thought used to like plague my mind too much because that only slows you down. And I think if you buy into that mentality and you play into it, I mean, that's only your demise that you're planning for. So. I guess you could say you don't give up because you know where you will be, um, you know, and it's about the journey for me. It's like, um, if I would have stopped years ago, I wouldn't have got to the Def Jam point. Um, and if not before that, you know, I'd already done big moves, like had a placement on um, Broad City, which is this show on FX. I performed at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. This is all like 2017 before the Def Jam deal. So I feel like each time I accomplish something, it's because of that fact that I didn't give up. Because definitely as an artist, you had these moments where you're just like, yo, I don't know. And I think um, people kind of hide and shade the fact that it's all linked also to like your mental health. So you can kind of mess your own mind up when you're watching other people or you're not really focusing on your race. And so that led to what we're talking about now. I found my niche and what really keeps me going in my fire burning, which is always, you know, popping up on a game, popping up on a movie. So if I'm not, you know, dropping a single with Def Jam, oh, you heard me in a film, you saw me in a game. And so that kind of brings buzz and a whole new audience back to, you know, the original campaign, which is the music. So, I mean, yeah, you just kind of can't quit. I think that's one of the basic rules. This is a tough lifestyle. It's a tough life. Um, there are moments where it's fun, but there are also the moments that artists don't show or talk about nearly enough where nothing is working. Your management, you feel like they're not moving. You feel like your team not grooving. There's a lot of things that can happen. Um, but you just got to be prepared for that. So, okay. So now um, I have one more question, and we're going to open up the uh, uh, the questions to the academy, Bebo. So, how did you link up with Def Jam? How did that happen? Tell us the story of, from beginning to mm -hmm. end. Okay. Um, so it's connection. It's straight like this. Um, 2017. I'm working a desk job. You know, I, I was working for the government private um, security contracting company, good desk job. I was getting paid a lot of money and you know, that was cool, that was fine. But every chance I got, every check I got, I was always going to the studio and investing had. I was going out to LA, sleeping on a friend couch, you know, trying to get in this studio or get a session with that person or trying to link up with this artist that I knew. And so that's always what I was doing. And so basically 2017, I went to LA so much I met my bro TK, who is a producer out there. And, you know, he's worked with a lot of dope people. He's always touring. He's like, yo, come stay with me for a little bit. I go out there for like a month. We just making music and I'm making a lot of music. And then I go back to my boring desk job. You know, it's, it's just time is going along. And then TK hit me one day and he's like, yo, 
can I pass your email along to like, you know, this homie who's an A&R? And I'm like, I mean, yeah, for sure. Duh, like, you know what I'm saying? Pass it along. And it turns out that TK had played him a bunch of music from all these artists that he's cultivating and working with. And my song was the last song he actually played because me and TK jokingly got in a dispute. And he was like, yo, I'm like, this song is crazy. Like, it's one of my favorite songs. And he's like, uh, it's dope, but I don't know. And then he's like, yo, you were right. Yo, he wants to meet with you out of all the music I played. And so he flew to DC, to the South Side. Actually, we was in Northeast at Frankie crib. We was in my boy crib. You know what I'm saying? The a came, kicked it. I'm rolling up. Everything's organic, how I always envisioned it. And, you know, I'm playing all my records. I play over a hundred something records. And I realized that like this A&R different. He had the attention span. He had the time and the interest. And he came to the city. And jokingly, before all of this happened, I always told my fam and my, and my boys and the people around me, like, yo, I'm going to do it differently. Like, they're going to come to us. They're going to come to the city. They're going to do this and that. And you never know how it pans out. But, yo, they ended up coming to the city. And then I take them to the carryout. I show them the fashion. He already see all of us, how we drift out. And he's just in love with something that he never saw. Because D.C. is a magical place, man. DMV is a crazy area. The fashion, the way we talk. He immediately bought into all of it. And then, you know, within a couple of weeks, there is an offer. Um, you know, I got my lawyers going back and forth. And then, you know, a month passed and, you know, they moved real fast on locking it in. The details were appropriate. You know, I did my due diligence and I felt that I was in a position where I needed to partner up with a label. I had done everything on my own. I'm throwing my own shows. I'm making my merch. I'm selling out my shows in D.C. You know, I'm streaming in millions already. It's like, but I'm, I'm running a little dry. Like, what more can I do? I need a little bit of steam. And they came in at the right time. We we're like, yo, they just kind of helped me build it up to kind of what you're seeing now. And we can talk about how it's working currently a little later, you know. And so it's an interesting development when you sign with a label. Awesome. Okay. Okay, Academy. Let's go with Jazelle's question first. Hello, my name is Jazelle. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Um, I'm pretty good. Anyway, my question is, um, I know that a lot of times people feel that they have to like go outside of DC to do like promote themselves as an artist and you just described that is exactly what you do, I mean, what you did. And my question is like, has it been harder now that BET is no longer in DC anymore for to say um, hip hop and R&B artists to get out there like and to have um, a channel for them to use to have their music go through? That's a good question. And it's kind of like a two part one. And I want to piggyback on what you said first. So I did go outside of DC. But I had to abbreviate it. It was like a good eight or so years where I did every show within the city. I mean, like, I'm like about DC. I do think that you have to go and take the opportunities when they arise. So I want to be clear about that because um, I stayed here. And sometimes I'm a little annoyed sometimes, you know, because there's opportunities and things that if I were living in LA, oh, yo, I would have been already in the studio or in this session writing for so-and-so, but they call you at like two in the morning. Yo, you free? It's like, that's how it really works. And that's the whole thing about being in the right place. Um, I think we'll get to that point here, but people got to come back here and do kind of like what I'm doing and a few other people. You got to bring that energy back home. So that's that point. And then so about the BET segment, I think that, yes, BET was a major network. But after the transition in which like they pretty much sold at the Viacom, which is the same company that owns MTV and all the other kind of like broadcasting things like that it kind of was already washed a little bit so the culture didn't really trust it as much at that point anyway and then we see things digitally starting to rise like revolt and the only reason i say revolt is that i think may, many more people are paying attention to platforms like that as opposed to bet because you're on your phone you know revolt does come on your tv but it's more on your phone your laptop and i think they do a great job at doing these artist segments a lot of new content and you kind of have to do that today because it's not just music videos people want to see. So we got like Complex and all these sites doing lifestyle pieces and more video content that in turn still operates like a MTV or like a BET. But I think Revolt, honestly, right now is like the most popular and prominent video platform. Like I feel like when you get a Revolt premiere, it's awesome. People actually um, check back on you. I think BET is dope when you're at a certain level and you need more eyes. But again, you'll always hear me say, 
it depends on what level you're at because you don't want to get on those things too soon and you have nothing for them to revert back to or almost you you know you don't have your your image your story you know there's a lot that you need to be prepared for when the masses do come to check on you so you know i feel like revolt and things like that way more reachable um honestly better right now because i don't really see everyone sitting around their tv watching bet jams that much no more so. <laughs> yeah that, that's a very good point so what you're saying is like uh it's very important to have this content, to have the music, to have the video, to have the album art and all these things out there already for somebody yes. to, to, instead of you going to them, you're attracting them to you by yes. producing. Yes. And, and furthermore, um, I think because this talk is about syncs. So let's bring it home because, because this links to it. Mm -hmm. Say I do get on coming to America or you hear my song in yesterday, two completely different demographics yesterday white, um, Jennifer Gardner, like whole nother fan base coming to America, Eddie, you know what I'm saying? More black and brown for the culture. I'm same week it comes out. I'm looking at my IG. I'm looking at the people DMing me. I'm looking at the, the stats and you, it reflects that. It's like, I'm getting new followers from both demographics. Now, will they stay? It'll be dependent upon what they see on my socials. If it really, you know, they might like the song in the movie, but then find out, Hey, look, it's BYP from Southeast. Oh, I didn't think he's not okay, whatever. But then some people might stay. You know, and that's always the risky one. Like with Spider-Man, I got a bunch of young kids, bunch of high school kids who were, they don't smoke, they don't do anything. So, you know, they're always messaging me, that's bad for your lungs and all that stuff. And I'm like, you're right. And stuff like that. But, you know, it's, it's just depending upon retention. And I say you have to be intentional about where you put your music with these sync placements, because that's what you'll end up dealing with. You don't want to do a big sync and you get all these 11 year olds that come and you just don't do anything. You're not Jojo Siwa, you know? So it's not gonna work for you. And so maybe I should also clarify what we mean when we say a synchronization, you know, or a sync placement, cause you'll hear me say that a bunch. And basically I mean, when you pair your audio with any television, video, commercial or game, you know, that's a sync placement. It is literally the pairing of, you know, audio, and visual and you know it's normally two people that that own this content you know for the video people it can be the company or you know the people that produce the content themselves on the artist end you own you know your publishing or your masters most of the time if you're an independent artist and i think we'll focus there for our conversation because you know this is more for burgeoning and upcoming and independent artists and trying to hip you all to how to go about either looking for syncs or just you know diving into that world because it's something i totally recommend a, it's a great way for artists to make income, you know, especially when you're on the come up. B, it's a great way to grow your audience. And those are literally the two biggest things about syncs, you know, and it's very dependent upon what type of sync you get. But just think about that. You can make money and you can grow your audience in a crazy way, you know, by pairing your music with some visual content. All right. Free game. Thanks, bro. Big hand no. You're up next, bro. Let's get it. Hold on. First and foremost, how you doing, brother? I'm good, brother. How you feeling? Everything's blessed, man. Everything's blessed. This is a part of the uh, academy that I wanted to be a part of. So I'm Big Hand No, CEO slash artist. I came up in Landover. What okay. I wanted to act, what I wanted to do first was salute you for the segment when you was talking about not giving up because you never know where the opportunity leads. Cause you know, I've been doing it for a long time. So yeah. I, that really, that really hit me right here in the heart. You know what I'm saying? No, so for I sure. Yeah, I appreciate that. Second of all, what I wanted to know, I heard you say you got your first sync placement in 2017. Is that what you said? It was about 2015. It was an FX okay. placement. Even better. Did you do that yourself? And what yes. platform did you use? Like a yes, website? I I'll tell you right now, I did do it myself and it was with FX. It was a comedy show called Broad City. And it's a pretty popular show. Um, and, you know, it's funny because with some of these placements, it's not something that I watch all the time. <laughs> but if they want to pay me to use 20 or 30 seconds of my song, a couple thousand dollars, you damn right. We yeah, good. You did. Yeah, and yeah. that's what you have to do first and foremost. Let's talk about this sync business. An open mind when creating and an open mind with where your music and song can go. And okay. so if you're an independent artist, which most of you guys are, I'm assuming yeah. this is for you guys. Like if you're right. going after sync placements, you have all the tools and power to do it yourself. It's right here on your phone. It's Twitter and it's Instagram and okay. any movie credits that you see, okay. any show credits that you see, any Netflix show you watch. All you got to do is Google that, 
who is the music supervisor? And this is what you take from here. I literally got on Twitter and headhunted different music supervisors from FX because I wanted to get some on American Horror Story. But then I had a record with my producer, Jalo, and it's like we sent it off and Matt FX, who is like the music supervisor for all of FX stuff, he hit us back and he wanted to put it in Broad City. So first off, it's very simple. Do the work and the research and find out where you want your music and then headhunt. Go to Twitter, type in music supervisor of power music supervisor of you know because i want some stuff on power that's what i'm going for next we all try yeah. to get these places yeah, and in the sure. industry you competing with major artists and indie artists but the misconception yeah. is i need to be a big artist to get a big sync no you right. don't for the simple fact that it costs more to clear a record from Lil wayne than it yeah, does to come true. to me and i can write a record in the vein of Lil wayne because i'm a songwriter and then for i sure. can make it 100 original and then get away with it because how many times do you turn on a tv or show and you go boy that is the melody or the beat to all the way up and it's some random person saying some yeah. lyric that sounds like all the way up that's the, <laughs> thing. That's the thing game it's yeah. called what bo does all the time they send you a reference once you're confirmed for it and it's like we are looking for something upbeat happy they might even have a song reference attached aka like a all the way up or something like that and what your job is to do is don't be byp be a writer a hired yeah. gun I am for made, sure. they want a Lil Wayne joint, prove that you can write and change your mindset. Write in for the sure. mindset of Wayne, choose a good beat, original is better because samples make everything harder to clear. And you know, you pitch these things to these different music supervisors. And the, the best advice I can give is build that music catalog and make it diverse. Even if you don't make a song that's groovy or dance like, understand that you watch film and TV all the time where it's eight moods, no one show is one mood. They need a fighting scene. They need an emotional scene. They need a romantic scene. So start to create and, and kind of work with intention. If you want something like syncs and it doesn't even have to be like off your album. Um, you know, if you have music off your album that works for it too, that's even better because all yeah. it does is go back to the album. So there it should kind of help how you create your music. Be smarter with it. Don't create it for one genre. Don't create it for one group. Think about the fact that there's millions of people waiting to hear this song in a game or, or like when I got on Madden, Yo, that was a crazy moment. <laughs> People all over was like, yo. So, so yeah, that's that's what you do, man. Headhunt the music supervisors. If you take anything from this, just know. Start to message and DM properly. And if you can email, that's even better. Get a DM to an email thread and just start pitching your stuff. Also, there's many sync companies that will pay you for access to your music library and your lyrics. And if your lyrics match up with something that they put in the prompt or the brief, you know, they will contact you and say, hey, we got a placement for you. Um, some of those sites, I got, I got a reference point here, actually. Um, two good ones is Taxi or That Pitch. And if you yeah. go on those sites, you can upload your music there and you can actually, they automatically try and sync it. But the only kill is you need to have 100% ownership. For example, Bo, I'm signed to a major label and I have a publishing deal. So when I am doing a sync, there's two sides to a song. There's the master side of the recording and the publishing. So for example, if Madden is paying $20,000, that's 20,000 aside, 20,000 for, for the publishing, 20,000 you know, for the master. And so it's 40,000 overall. And depending on who you have on your team, publisher, agent, you know, you know, it might break down differently. So that's why I always say, if you're independent, own your catalog until you don't need to anymore. Because if you just BMI or ASCAP it, you are your sole publisher. And then you get the master and publishing side of your song. You know, me with Def Jam, Def Jam is always going to take a side of the master because that's part of recouping your deal. It's a proper, smart business. And, you know, hey, I get a lot of syncs, so I pay off, you know, my advance very quick, very fast. So if you're like me, you don't owe the label nothing at the end of the day after a few sync placements, then I'm on the road making all my show money, all my streaming money, my merch money, and so on and so forth. Hey, Bo, free game. Boy, I appreciate that. That's what Salute. we're here for, man. Yeah, that's I appreciate what we're here for. that. All right, Getty. You are up, sir. That actually flows into my question pretty well. Um, yeah. So I've, I'm, I'm 32, my last 10 years out of college. My wife and I are both designers. She's a creative director. Um, so I've been very aware of kind of the other side of the world. I've always done music, finally dug in like six months ago. So I've been prepping everything, the design, the albums, visuals. I do everything myself, and I kind of have that mindset of it. Where would you – or where did you kind of see – how, how do you rank your kind of sources of the income? Not getting into your money, but when you talk about yeah. your sinks and your merch, like I, 
I mean, let's say coming from a design background, I kind of have that all mapped out. I, you know, I design brands. So where would you kind of focus and where do you kind of see the most bang for your buck and what influences? You okay. Like? Can, can I ask um, one question before I answer that? What type of designing do you do? Are we talking like um, clothing like what what or we're talking about graphic designing what what so it's going to be it's going to be it's going to be everything so i've i've had a graphic design company where i make brands logos and websites mainly um but kind of everything so i'll have clothing albums probably poster like traditional graphic design um and then syncing and all that stuff is where i'm interested i'm not trying to play clubs every night you know what i mean i'm kind of coming from the other side that supplement with big shows and make my money where i can selling off on different avenues online but yeah, they're all open yeah. and I'm just kind of wondering where to put more of my focus. I think you're actually in a great position because you're coming into it from another discipline. But all of this is interdisciplinary because literally graphic designing and everything you're doing is going to go hand in hand. So firstly, you're going to be able to do all of that in-house and cut a lot of costs, which Bo is always about. Yes. Um, secondly, dude, we're in the phase of um, digital media, NFTs stuff like that, what I would do is premiere my music with an NFT if you're a good graphic designer and I would start there, you know, um, DM me after this and I can tell you a little bit more about like what I'm really thinking about that because that's what jumps out immediately at me with you is you already have a digital aspect. So now we need to put the music behind it because you're probably dope with the graphics and we need to have them listening to that while we see the graphics and then you pair that with what's going on right now. Um, so that's one thing. And then again, the music is simple. Um, for you, if you're not interested in performing at clubs and things like that like every night and you want to do you know bigger circuits you're perfect for the sync game and i don't want to say a syncable artist but yes i would just create different content like i do i'm looking at esp and i'm like okay i need something with drums like this and then you need to definitely hit up some of those companies like cd baby has a great program um taxi again things like that and again dm me if you want some of these like resources because for you that's all it would take is uploading some of those sonics to those platforms. And I think in a little while, you'll start building a unique base because you have like the visual aspect. And again, it's like the digital revolution right now. So I think visuals and are always in the forefront. And now we're talking, your music is kind of like the back end, the soundtrack into the things you're creating. And if you approach it that way, it'll be more natural for you. And I think you'll have a lot more fun and you won't worry about a lot of other things because you can do the merch, You that, that'll be one source of income, you know? And for me, that's exactly how I like to operate. I have merch which is a decent part of my income, not the largest unless I'm on the road. And so that's important to remember. If you're not building a clothing line and things like that, merch will be for the pure fans who really want to buy that. In a time like today, you got to have leisure money and all of that stuff to even buy people's merch. So, you know, merch does best for me on the road. Um, But mainly I do well off like the royalties from um, these sync placements, which is a residual, because if it's on a television show that re-airs, you get paid every time. So that's always good. In the initial advance from a sinking, because some of these sinks, for example, can be 50, 100K, 15, $150, 1200. You can imagine, depending on the size, the length of the sink placement, how many seconds of the song, the country it airs in, duration, all of that determines, you know, how much you'll get paid. But that's kind of how mine breaks down. And then, you know, if outside opens up, large part of my income is show money. And, you know, I'm touring all the time. So, that's really where it comes in. And so, um, you know, I'm like the opposite of you. I'm like a very on stage. I want to perform in the club every night. I want to sell merch every night and I want to shake hands every night. Cause that also goes right back to my fan base and that interaction that you have with them every night, it'll never leave them. So I love the live aspect, but I can understand where you're coming from. All right, Jojo, okay. you are up. Hey, what's up, Bo? This is Josie. I'm an artist from PG County, Maryland, man. I appreciate you coming in and dropping this wisdom on us, man. Thank you. Thank you. What's good with you? Yeah, so funny enough, right, when I saw that you were up to speak, I was like, man, I know this guy for real because uh, we go to the same studio. So Carl oh, you're up at Gemstar. Yeah, Carl has your plaque up there, you know, from the Spider-Man movie. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, I see your stuff up there all the time, and it's just it's humbling, but it's also refreshing because it's like, you don't need to be, you know, have millions of followers on Instagram or whatever we, we deem success for you to be a success. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? So I guess I had two questions. Well, you kind of answered the first question about sync placements. I was wondering how, you know, how you got your song on the Spider-Man, um, Spider-Man movie. But okay. my second question, which is probably the more important question was, 
you know, in our area, we understand that, you know, the popular music is, is a certain niche. And you spoke about that, like how you kind of felt alienated, but you still created your mm-hmm. lane, you still found shows. Yep. So how did you find the different nests for your sound, you know, okay. in the area? Cool. Dope questions, bro. Um, so Spider-Man, real short. Um, that was one of the few sync opportunities that I did get through Def Jam. Um, I literally, when I signed, they do this thing where they kind of like show you off to everybody in the building. Here's the new signee and all that crap. And literally when they did that though, I took the opportunity to shake every hand of the department I really wanted to meet. Like the radio department, I shook their hand. And then when I learned about what TV and sync was, I went over there and started politicking with them the most. And so basically they took a liking to me and the fact that I can send them a variety of music really quick. I'm always in call studio making these different tracks. And so they kind of hit me up with a response. I sent them a song that I made when my uncle passed, not even thinking of Spider-Man. And then they hit me back like, yo, this will be perfect for the new Spider-Verse because labels, they get it first. They get the pitches sent to them. We're looking for something in power. We're looking for something in Fast and Furious. Like I've pitched music for Fast and Furious, um, the new Space Jam, we still haven't heard back, but it's looking good. Like it's, it's a lot of things that they get to drop on first. But that was one of the rare opportunities that really did come through Def Jam. And I'll be honest, a lot of the things, bro, still come from me off the muscle because, again, making the music I make and saying, I'll lead this into the next question, I have 15K Instagram followers. I signed when I had 3K, and that wasn't that long ago. I'm a different type of guy in the building, and I feel like, you know, they do look at numbers and, and all of that crap, but I keep defying it in the building. Like, I come in 260 million streams, this and that, and it's like, that's the campaign you got to be with, though. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I still go after sync placements myself. I'm still shooting all my videos and stuff myself. I'm not waiting on anything to happen. And that's how I got to this point. In DC, I wasn't getting booked enough to my liking. I had millions of streams before the deal. And, you know, I was cool in the underground, which is what I helped build, though. That wasn't enough. It's like I wanted to be, you know, up there in my area. It was like Wale, Tabby, you know what I'm saying? Like a lot of different stuff starting to form. But then as I started to make my name, you know, it was like Glizzy and people like that. And it's just like, you know, what you mentioned about DC, the main sound right now, and I hate the term DC drill. I just say DC trap because we don't even do drill like that here. Like that's something that they imposed on us on that YouTube and, and we'll, that's another subject. But like, you know, I, I come from that and it's like, I get that. But that's why I don't really rap about that because like it's enough for that. And I always had that. And I knew it would be a tougher, longer road, straight up. You know what I'm saying? But my influences being people like Cuddy and, you know, Andre 3000 and like Pac and stuff like that. But still, I can make a record. I got a track with Young Nudie, got one with Hefe, got one with Flip Danelle. Like, I'm a musician. I can make a party record because trap is just popular music. It don't mean I got to rap about killing and this and that, though. So I can still compete with the best of them because look at artists like Travis and stuff like that. These guys are suburban kids. You know what I'm saying? Making the hardest music ever. So I never got kind of daunted from it because I knew. And I was looking at people like I was coming up and doing South by Southwest when I shared a stage with Travis and people like that. And I'm like, yo, in other cities is bumping people who, who rip their jeans. I'm a rock star. That's what I always been. DC is the home of punk. I used to paint my nails. I used to rip my jeans. I still do all of that stuff. But I was like, yo, I'm going to just keep being me because that's what they're going to look at when they come to the city. They're going to be bombarded with a million rappers that unfortunately sound the same. And when you love talking about an A&R, he has to find somebody that's going to cut through. Someone that's going to look different, sound different, because that's what it's really about. If you can already recognize someone's signature on someone else, then it's already lost, unfortunately. And I think as an artist coming from our area, we got to keep that in mind. It's like we starting to move and sound like other places. But if you go to my campaign, I'm always beating my feet on stage. My first major joint with Def Jam, I made sure it was called Kill Mo. I made sure I shot it in D.C. Could have took that budget and went anywhere. And, you know, I just always make sure that I bring my documentaries here or we highlight in the city. We talking about the carryout. We talking about go-go. We talking about punk music. We I got a new song coming out called Chop and it's straight up just about, yeah, you're going to chop to it. And it's like, that's the energy that we kind of got to harness. And those who possess it, you see, they are making it out. And you got to look at what's really happening with the Rico Nasties, the Ari Lennoxes, the IDKs, the Young Mannies, you know what I'm saying? The Money Mars, even people like Q the Fool, No Savage, Hefe. And it's like we got a large presence across the spectrum. But it's room for those different guys because who going to be the Rocky? Who going to be the Travis? Who going to be the, the K Trinata? Like who going? And I'm not saying those people that you should be like, but who's going to help us, you know, divert 
from this sound and, and help us really break through with our dances. You know how we chop and beat our feet with our lingo, our slang, our beanies rolled, our 992. They take everything from us. So because we don't hold it down enough and the artists that are on, unfortunately, we got to go harder to represent that. So I think if you're doing that, you're going to cut through. Excuse me. You're going to cut through because it's only a matter of time. Like all the labels are here. They are snatching kids left and right. I know. I be hearing it. I'm in the building. I, I know what's up. So, you know, um, young Manny, my old neighbor, it's hilarious. But, but bro, keep being you. It's like, that's what I would tell you. Because I love talking to, to the guys on the fringe or they still put me on Spotify as alternative and I can drop a trap song. But they, it's just because of what I am and how I pr promote myself. So it's like, you do that. Because that's going to be the music they get in the movies. That's going to be the music they get in the games. And then, you know, you use that to kind of create your niche. Like, I want to be on, like, Cartoon Network and Adult Swim and have my music behind anime and stuff like that because I'm really into that. Like, so just find out what you're into and attack those niche markets. You feel me? Or, like, fashion, for example. Like, everybody listening to me, get on a TikTok. I know it looks like it's corny or whatever, but we're in a phase where if you really want to drive traffic to your IG and your other socials, do something on TikTok because the, the fan base is there and the community that they built on that platform is one that goes back to your other stuff. So like if you, even in the studio, this is how I lay down a verse. This is how I make a beat. Do that and put it up there because you never know. This platform lets random stuff go viral. You got to attack it. And that's another thing I wanted to say because top 10 songs right now are coming from TikTok. And I don't even think that's crazy. These kids are smart. They are creating in a way that we all should be thinking, getting straight to it. It's about the hook and the verse. And now you can craft a real song that then you can take to radio and holler at the guys like Malcolm X and Bacon Bear because when they are judging the record locally, they're looking for something that they can compete with the Drake record that they just played because, you know, that's what it is. And so, you know, it's all the mindset. When you, whether you think in syncs, whether you think in breaking out of the DMV, create with intention and don't divert from it, you know? All right, Josh Anderson, sir, you are up, Mr. Batman. Thanks for having me, uh, Bo Man. Some good knowledge you're spilling, man. Some good game. Um, I want to say that I appreciate you because, um, you know, a couple of months before I even heard a song, you know what I mean? I kind of just saw the grind, you know what I mean? Before I even knew about the placements and you was representing. So I, I gave it Thank the follow. You. And from that point, it was just like, you know what I mean? This hometown right here, you know what I mean? Yeah. I support home. Um, definitely with some of the things I just want to mention real quick uh, before my question uh, Crazy Legs is doing something wild with the kids so anybody that want to be part of that and he's doing original music for the youngest with the Beach Your Feet Academy it's pretty big and it's international if y'all don't know check them out yep um, so you know one of my um, I just have two questions um, my first question is when you uh prepare a record for a sync license, do you release it first, then go for the sync, or is it something where you have the record? I, I'm not clear on that part of it. Okay, <clears throat> so it depends on how the sync comes about, and that can be two ways. Um, if I pitch the sync myself, then most likely the record shouldn't be out because they want exclusivity, and they just kind of want something that's original that hasn't been out because they need to like deconstruct it. So you got to submit it with the instrumental, a clean version always, and then also with the lyric sheet because they need to see if the song matches up. So in one regard, yes, the song is not out. You know, I pitched it and it's behind the scenes and it will come out because sometimes they want exclusive music. Like we're coming to America, they dropped a soundtrack with it. So it was an exclusive license, you know, through Def Jam and with the film. And, you know, that's like a two part sync, you know, because it's coming out on the film with Amazon, but it's also coming out, you know, via Def Jam. So that was under wraps. You couldn't have the song out. Sometimes they don't care. In the prompt, they'll say we need released or unreleased music. And then that's when I'll just send them a bit of both. If I trust the source, it's like because some of these songs will never come out anyway. And that's the point of being an artist. I create stuff just for like basketball or ESPN. And if you listen to We Got The Moves, I made that for Coming To America and the new Space Jam. That's why it's heavily basketball represents, you know, riddled throughout. And so with a song like that, I'll send in, you know, a couple records that might be out. Like, um, what's a song that got out? Like True Blues was already out and got a sync. I mean, Move The Change was out and it keeps getting resynced. Like All American, um, Basketball Wives, All American just re-upped the sync deal. 
and they're going to use it for an IG real campaign just for like their commercials. So that's what I'm talking about, about those residual um, royalties, which something re-airs and they just literally send you a new contract like, yep, we're using it again. And the terms either stay the same or you can negotiate for more. Um, it's up to you and your team. But um, those are the two ways, you know, you either pitching it and it's unreleased or it's already out and they're contacting you. Okay. Um, you, can you still there? Yeah, you said yeah. yeah. You said you got two questions. What's number two? Okay, number two, real quick, I see other people got questions. Um, so when it comes to syncing your music, do like like you said, with one synchronization, it got you a lot of with one synchronization, it was it was like this crowd, that crowd. Do you feel like it changes your creativity or you feel a level of responsibility? The fact that you are pulling this crowd is like, I might have to maneuver like this or change up this, or now that I know the youngins watching me, let me go ahead and like, do you ever feel that type of? <clears throat> I, yes, I do, if, if I'm being honest. Um, and this is something that I balance in my artist career because the Spider-Man movie, as I talked about before, it led to a lot of high schoolers and kids who led dealt with depression and suicide and things like that, sending me a deep notes and how they, this song helped them, stop them from doing things and stuff like that. And from that point on, they watch everything you do. I think just as an artist and the type of artist I am, I'm always kind of conscious of the fact that kids are watching me. But let me be clear, um, you know, I am me. Like, you know, I'm a cannabis connoisseur and, you know, I have my own strain coming out for 20, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, so I'm gonna always do my thing, but, I keep in mind that kids are watching me always. There's a time and place for it. And so I just think that comes with the territory. And I'm not saying don't be yourself because a lot of things go into, you know, what kids take in. And I think there's levels to what you're promoting straight up, especially if we're talking rap. Do I feel bad, guilty about anything I post or promote? No, because it comes with pure intention and straight from here. And it's like, you see me, you see, yeah, he does this and that, but also he promotes this, that, and the third. So, um, yeah, so that comes with the territory. But also, if we're talking about crafting the music, I always feel a responsibility to deliver whatever the project needs. If I know this is going on a family show, I am not about to submit a song with a bunch of cuss words because that's just crazy. It's like you wouldn't do that for radio either. So you have to create with intention. Don't submit a song to radio that's riddled with cuss words. They're not going to spin it. Don't send a song in for a kid's show. Sometimes they say we want gangster, this, that, and the third in the prompt because you know who writes some of these things. And it's just like, okay, now you know what they want. And then you can go crazy. So I, I will say they do guide what they want. You can, you know, like if you're dealing with a show, like I just got a prompt for the spinoff, you know what I'm saying? That's coming next from Power. And they want gritty hip hop. The words mentioned gritty, dark, bass, things like that. And so, yeah, now I'm going to create knowing that it's for Power. Yo, this, yeah, I know what I'm going to do. So I think you have to work smarter, not harder, and take it on a case-by-case -case scenario. And if certain fans come from a certain thing, I immediately post things to let them know this is what you're getting into. This is Groovy Land. This is the world of BYP. This is what we do. And, um, you know, if that vibe is for you, it's for you. It's the same with my music journey. I'm not for everyone. Everyone's not for me, but we're going to find out what works, you know? You know, I want to ask you a question, uh, Bo. Yep. You, you said a lot, man, and I really appreciate you, um, you know, sharing all this important information. This is this is very dynamic, and this is probably one of the best, and this is, I'm not, no disrespect, this is probably one of the best sessions that we've had as far as information. And uh, what, what, it, what it shows me is your knowledge, man. Your, 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 your knowledge of all this is off the charts, bro. Your knowledge of all this is, 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 is on a thousand. Thank you. So how, did, how did you get all this information uh, that you're sharing with us uh, to be able to use it uh, uh, toward your, your, your benefit and your success? Um, so I guess I gained this knowledge first through experience dating back to me being hungry enough to seek out an opportunity to even send in a song to you know, get an interview on your show, just that type of diligence and aggressiveness with my career definitely led to these um, opportunities. And I would also say the persistence of it all. Um, every time I failed, I wanted to know why I failed and I wanted to know what I could do better. That's what I do. I'm like that in sports. I'm like that when I was working for even my regular job. Like, how can I learn how to, you know, be a better HR person? Like, how can I learn how to be a better administrative executive? And it's just part of, like, how I'm wired. Uh, and then after I did that job, I, I picked up a mentor, uh, my man, Fernando Galaviz. Like, he's like a, 
a multimillionaire type of guy locally out in VA. And he just took me under his wing and I would go to the meetings with him and I would watch him close deals. And I kind of learned um, how to be a sponge sometimes and not talk all the time, but listen and take in game because most of the times in these rooms, you're not the biggest person. So you need to observe and look at how the biggest person moves and take in the good and get rid of the bad and add it to your repertoire. If you're on stage and you're on tour, you need to look at the headliner. It's not just about you. Take in what the headliner does. Lead the bad, add the good to your repertoire. And I think that's my process. Um, you're going to fail sometimes and I don't know everything. And when I don't, I pull back and I go seek someone who does. And so I do the work and research to find someone who can kind of educate me into what I'm looking into. And I think just paying attention got me here. Um, I'm definitely strong-minded and I consider myself to be smart. And so that plays a part into it. Like going in Def Jam, I went into the meeting way different. I played Bo's game. It's like, I know guys coming here iced out, you know what I'm saying, guapped out, fly as hell, you know, do a little jig or dance blast. I went in different. I said, yo, nice to meet y'all. I had the whole staff sit down and I talked about my vision, my background, you know what I'm saying, what I want to accomplish with y'all and see where their mind really was at. And so it's the kind of the air you let off when you're in these rooms too. And I think um, on the show side, you got to get stiffed a few times to know what type of shows not to take or what type of promoters not to deal with. On the contractual side, I don't really mess up on those too much at all. I try to never do that because get a lawyer, you know, don't do no contract without a knowledgeable lawyer and you won't even have those issues. Never have I had an issue contractually with Def Jam, never had a little hiccup because I knew what I was getting into. I knew my terms and agreements. And I guess you could say the underlying thing is do the research. I studied and looked up contracts. Um, looked up what's actually fair in a record contract, what most people get, and then what exceptional artists get and what like developing artists get. And I just was honest every step of the way about where I am, where I know something, I know something, where I don't, I bring in someone that does. Um, and I think that mentality mixed with being humble enough to know that you don't know everything and you can always learn will get you there because I'm still learning every day with like the people I keep around me, whether it's like a peace stew or whether it's like my man Chavez or whether it's like just the a and that brought me through, like coaching me on like, you know, I'm a Scorpio, keep your emotions intact because this game will test you. Um, it's a lot of BS, it's a lot of politics, a lot of ups and downs. Even once you sign a deal, that's the beginning of it. So now I'm learning a new language in a new world, you know? So I'm still learning like everybody else. Now I know how to move in a building. Now I know what a sync department is, what the radio department does, um, you know, what the marketing department does. And I know the value of each. So every time you add a piece to your team, study them before you do that and just do the work. That's all it's going to come down to. Like you learn through experience, um, trial and error, success and failure, and, you know, just doing the work. So that's what I do. Like, I, I like to think like, that's what I represent. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. Final question. Uh, we have like three minutes left. Final questions. I see Jojo's hand right there. I don't know if that's a question. Do we have any final questions or comments that you would like to make to uh, uh, Bo before we bounce? Uptown, I see your hand up. Is that? What's up, Bo? I'm Uptown. I'm an up and coming artist from the DC area. I have one question for you. As an artist right now, what is one of your biggest goals that you want to achieve? Um, I guess uh, one of the biggest goals I am trying to achieve as an artist. That's definitely a tough question for real, real, because it's like you have so many, but let's narrow it down. Um, I don't want to go the Grammy route because I definitely have a Grammy nomination and that was cool, but it didn't actually bring the validation or anything I really wanted to myself. So I'm going I'm to leave the award stuff to the side. Um, I went double platinum. I don't know. I just want longevity in this business. I want to be here 20 years from now um, mm -hmm. and still like able to afford everything I do. I pay off from music right now. And it's a blessing. Like it wasn't always this way. And I just remember a life before this. And it's like, I'm not the biggest artist. So I'm very blessed that I'm at a level where I can sell merch. I can tour and do things. So I would just like to, my goal is to be here. Longevity, man. My goal is to be here 20 years from now, um, you know, that's what's up. Appreciate it. Is there a way we can send you music somehow? Yeah. Um. Start. Hit my DM and send me the link, and I'm going to tap it, and it's going to go right to the AirPods. Let's gotcha. do it. Thank you, bro. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, y'all. Give it up for Bo. The homie. Man, we're very proud of you. I appreciate y'all. Nah, yeah. man. We're, we're very proud of you, man. Like, seeing you make these moves and 
going like this when Dion hit me up and said, yo, we got him. I was like, oh, snap. Love Dion. Shout out Dion. Shout out the whole family over there, guys. Make sure you connect with those, those type of people. Last gym. Relationships. Make them. Just look at me and easy. Man, look how I, I'm, I have a great relationship with the radio DJs now. Go to their events. Support them. Share their flyers. You know, get the response you want to get from people. So relationships, relationships. Awesome. All right. One more round of applause for Bo, y'all. That's all we got for today. For the new people that uh, came through, uh, we are officially going to be uh, hitting you up about our uh, our next sessions. Um, let me see who we got. Uh, we have uh, Melinda Santiago, who's going to come in and talk about management in the next couple of days. Um, she's currently working with Bobby V. And uh, our, our next month uh, list of, uh, of guests is going to be amazing as well. So if you have any questions, you know where to find me. Uh, until then, we'll see you guys on Monday. Salute. Y'all have a great weekend. Everybody be safe. Please stay masked up. And we will see you next time. All right? Peace. Bye. Thanks, Bo. Yeah, thank you. Thank Thanks, you, guys. Bo. I'll be back. Thank you. I got you. <laughs> All right. Appreciate you. All right, easy. All right. Be safe, y'all.